Good morning. I'm, uh, I'm honored to introduce the Honorable Joan E. Donahue, the 2015 recipient of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation Medal in Law. Judge Donahue is a member of the International Court of Justice, uh, otherwise known as the World Court. She is the first American woman to have been elected to serve as a member of that court. As a member of the ICJ, Judge Donahue helps resolve disputes between sovereign states. The court also gives advisory opinions on legal matters referred to it by the United Nations. By convention, one of its seats is held by an American. Hardy Cross Dillard, a former dean of the law school, served in that capacity in the 1970s. Born in Yonkers, New York, Judge Donahue is a graduate of the University of California, Santa Cruz, and the University of California at Berkeley Law School. She began her legal career in 1981 at Covington and Burling. In 1984, she began her distinguished career at the State Department, which continued until 2010 with a few brief interludes and included legal work in several of its offices. Her last posting before her appointment to the World Court was Principal Deputy Legal Advisor, the State Department's most senior career legal position. During the early months of the Obama administration, she served as the acting legal advisor. In that time, according to one colleague, she, quote, quickly earned the trust of the State Department's senior leadership and in so doing, empowered the legal advisor's office. As a State Department officer, Ms. Donahue touched almost every possible area of international law. She provided guidance to the United States on international humanitarian and human rights law, the implementation of the UN Security Council and uh, implementation of UN Security Council and General Assembly resolutions, the United States treaty approval process, uh, and the law of the sea, Antarctica, the Arctic, fisheries, and the environment. She provided legal counsel on, among others, the implementation of the Panama Canal Treaty, the ICJ case Nicaragua versus the United States, the negotiation of the United States Framework Convention on Climate Change, the transition to democracy in South Africa, the establishment of the, of the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, investment negotiations involving the OECD, and President Obama's executive orders on Guantanamo, detention, and interrogation. She also served as representative to the United States European Union Legal Dialogue and representative to the Council of Europe Committee of Legal Advisors. She has been a mentor to countless lawyers and supervised three of our own faculty during their tenure at State, Professors Paul Stephen, John Harrison, and Ashley Deeks. Colleagues have described her as incredibly smart and someone with a strong moral compass and excellent judgment. At the State Department, Ms. Donahue received both the Presidential Meritorious Honor Award and the Distinguished Honor Award, the highest award given by the U.S. Secretary of State. We take pride in adding to this list the Thomas Jefferson Foundation Medal in Law, named after a lawyer who served as this country's first Secretary of State. Please join me in welcoming Judge jo Joan Donahue. Well, thank you very much, Dean Mahoney, uh, and thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, it's great to be somewhere so beautiful and so spring-like. Uh, certainly, there's much more spring here than we have in the Netherlands. However, there's also a lot more pollen. So uh, I'm just going to grab my water. Uh, and I know that um, quite a number of you are first-year law students and that many of you uh, have not studied international law and, in fact, may not have any intention of doing so and may not um, see that as an area of focus for you. Um, and that's one reason why I thought today that I would talk about the influence of the common law and civil law traditions on the work of the International Court of Justice where, where I sit. Um, because um, you have all by now a pretty good understanding of how a court operates. And uh, so uh, you don't need to understand our jurisprudence, the content of what we do, in order, I think, to get an appreciation of the way that we operate and think about how it is the same as or different from uh, what, what you are accustomed to here in the United States. Um, so um, I want to just uh, start by um, 
saying a little bit about well, what I mean when I speak about the common law and the in civil law traditions. Of course, um, you in the United States are all being trained in the common law tradition, the tradition that we and, and other English-speaking nations have inherited from England. And in fact, in your case books, especially when you look at older cases, cases the case books kind of move back and forth pretty seamlessly between English cases and US cases because of that similarity. Um, and when I speak of the civil law system, I'm speaking instead of a system that derives from continental Europe. And um, in particular, for the International Court of Justice, the civil law system that is of greatest relevance is the civil law system um, as it uh, has developed and as it is practiced in France. That's because the French traditions have had the greatest impact on um, international courts generally and, and on our court in particular. Um, I should say also two other things about um, your training in common law. Um, whether you realize it or not, when you're being trained in the United States in the common law, you're actually also getting a little bit of comparative law training um, because we have 50 states. And in a civil law tradition in a state that is not a federal state, um, if you were learning a particular question in law, you would essentially be studying a code provision um, and what it meant. But in your training, you are constantly being exposed to different rules that apply to an idea. You're constantly hearing discussions of the majority rule, the minority rule, for example. So you are constantly engaging in a process of comparing one way of approaching a legal issue to another. Um, I want to make one other preliminary remark about uh, vocabulary. I just spoke about the 50 US states, and that's the way in the United States we usually use the word state. Um, but um, in international law, we generally refer to countries or nations as states. And so for the rest of this discussion today, when you hear me speak about states, that's what I'm talking about. I, I mention that when I speak to US audiences because I find it can cause some confusion. And I tried at one point to purge it from my vocabulary, and it just, uh, just didn't work very well. So um, I ask you just to, just to bear that in mind. So um, let, let me say a little bit more about um, the civil law tradition. And let me say that um, for any common lawyer, any lawyer trained in the common law, to describe the civil law tradition, there is a tendency on the part of common lawyers to depict it in something of a caricature. Um, and I'm mindful of that, but at the same time, for our purposes today, I am going to present a fairly stark view of it to provide a contrast to the common law tradition. And uh, in some sense, therefore, I'm going to leave out some of the nuances and some of the ways in which more recently there's been some movement on the civil law side within civil law countries um, towards uh, ideas and practices that are familiar to us in the common law tradition. Um, the first significant um, point, I think, for um, the, the civil law tradition is that the law is found in codes, what we would call statutes. Cases do not serve as a source of law in the, in the civil law tradition. Um, and that comes from an idea, and here, very kindly, Professor Stephen has brought me my notes, uh, which uh, I can do OK without, but it's better if I have them. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, so I was just talking about um, a stereotype of the uh, civil law tradition uh, to, to, that we can then juxtapose. Um, so the idea of codes, um, which again, this is a, something of a caricature, but the idea after the French Revolution is that judges were not to be trusted. They shouldn't be given a lot of discretion. So codes should be designed, um, and then they should be applied by judges in a way that was almost mechanical, um, so that the, they could simply um, look to the codes, find answers to questions, and be done with it, and not exercise the kind of discretion that was seen as threatening during um, during the pre-revolutionary period in France. Um, so um, in addition, those decisions of judges um, in the civil law system serve to settle the specific dispute that's before the court, but they do not serve as rules of decision for anyone else. They don't bind that court, and they don't have any binding effect on non-parties. And partly for that reason, the, the reasons given in a typical civil law tradition are extremely brief. 
often one sentence, sometimes a long sentence, but often one sentence saying, we've considered this, these are the relevant code provisions, here's the answer. Um, quite different from what we see in our tradition, of course. Um, also, when you move into the courtroom, the proceedings are entirely different. Our proceedings are, of course, adversarial, and that means that they are largely party-driven. We have rules, but the parties, especially the initiating party, are the ones who decide how the proceedings will go. And by contrast, on the civil law side, the procedure, which is often described as inquisitorial, is guided largely by a judge, a judge organizing the proceeding in the way that the court thinks makes sense and deciding which evidence should be developed, which, case, which uh, law should be developed. And sometimes then moving the issue on from an initial pre-child judge to a different judge who will then ultimately decide the case. There is little scope for live testimony. Most of the evidence is presented through paper. So I think you can see from that brief overview that there is quite a difference between what the way our proceedings work in the common law system and the way they work typically on the civil law side, again, specifically um, with respect to France. So now that you know a little bit about that, let's talk about what the International Court of Justice is and what we do. And again, bearing in mind that most of you are new to international law. Um, our court is not designed to be either a civil law or a common law court. Um, what do we do? Well, our court, which is known by the nickname the World Court, um, is a court of 15 judges set up as the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, and we sit in The Hague in the Netherlands. The idea of a World Court first took hold in about 1900. Um, and it gave rise eventually to the first world court, which was called the Permanent Court of International Arbitration, which was established under League of Nations auspices. And eventually our court, which is very similar in terms of structure and jurisprudence, was established when the UN was set up after World War II. Um, this, the Permanent Court and our court as world courts were innovative in two important respects. Before that, there had been examples of two states taking a case to arbitration, to third party binding dispute settlement. Um, but the difference was that here we had something that was a standing court that was available to parties that wished to take cases to it um, and to which the parties could consent, uh, be, they could accept the court's jurisdiction before there was a specific dispute. And that means they could consent to the court's jurisdiction before they knew, if you will, which side of the V they would be on in a case. Would they be initiating a case or responding to a case brought by someone else? Uh, and that means that this kind of court, this world court, was set up to be responsive not only to the two states appearing before it, as an arbitral tribunal is, but actually to the world community more generally. Um, in addition, they, as I said, they could agree in advance to submit the case to jurisdiction. So those were the two big innovations of the idea of a world court as compared to ad hoc arbitration of state-to-state -state disputes. Our court hears two kinds of cases. First, let me say, we do not hear criminal cases. We do not decide whether a particular individual is accountable for a violation, for, for, a, for an international crime. There are other courts that do that in The Hague, most notably the International Criminal Court and the International Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. We don't do that. We decide two kinds of cases. First, we decide, uh, we render advisory opinions to other organs of the United Nations when they ask for them. And that's about 20% of our work. So about 80% of the court's docket historically has been in what we call contentious cases. And those look a little bit like a civil case in our system in the sense that you have one state bringing a case against another state. And what they are complaining about is a violation of international law. We don't apply foreign law. Usually they're complaining that there was a violation either of a particular treaty or treaties or of customary international law. Um, states can consent to our jurisdiction in three different ways. First, they can consent generally to the jurisdiction of the, of the International Court of Justice. A little over 70 states have done that. What that means, of course, is that about two-thirds of the states that exist today have not done that, uh, have not accepted the court's jurisdiction generally. 
The United States, after World War II, did accept the court's jurisdiction generally, but withdrew that acceptance in the wake of the Nicaragua decision in the mid-1980s, which the U.S. Did, didn't like. Uh, and then the decision was taken um, after the court exercised jurisdiction, and the, and the U.S. view, the Reagan administration view, was that the court lacked jurisdiction. Um, the second way, and important way, for uh, states to reflect their consent to the court's jurisdiction is in particular treaties. Treaties typically contain at the end something called a compromissory clause, and it says um, what the parties agree to as mechanisms for resolving disputes about the application and interpretation of that particular treaty. And many compromissory clauses provide for the International Court of Justice jurisdiction. For example, when the United States brought a case against Iran, when Ur Iran was holding U.S. diplomats hostage, it was a compromissory clause of a, of, of a multilateral treaty on which the United States uh, relied. I should say, by the way, that the United States has appeared before the World Court both as the initiating state we call applicant and as the respondent, and has appeared before the court in more contentious cases than any other state, and also in more advisory opinion uh, proceedings than, than any other state. So the third way that states can end up before our court is that two states can decide jointly to bring a case to us in the same way that states might choose to go to an arbitral tribunal to bring a case. So I'll just give you a couple of examples of the kinds of cases that we decide. Uh, Belgium brought a case against Senegal under the Compromissary Clause of the Convention Against Torture. Um, the problem for Belgium was that the former dictator of Chad had been a longtime resident in Senegal, and um, uh, parties to the Convention Against Torture have an obligation to prosecute torturers who are found in their territory, or if they do not do so, to extradite them. Belgium said that uh, Senegal was in breach of that obligation, uh, and the court agreed and ordered Senegal to prosecute Mr. Habre without undue delay. And soon after our decision, those proceedings began uh, with some support, financial support from other states and institutional support from the African Union. We have a steady diet of land and maritime boundary cases, and if you think about it, that really makes a lot of sense because disputes over territory, disputes over boundary, often involve, of course, resources. Uh, it, they involved uh, the loyalties of the people in the areas, and they are usually very politically sensitive in the particular states involved, and thus very difficult to resolve through agreement. And they also often involve people getting killed. When you hear the expression border skirmish, it, it sounds like something small, but it's probably not small if you're one of the people being shot at in that disputed border territory. Um, so those are some examples of the kinds of cases we hear. Um, so why, why do we have an ICJ? Well, you've, you've heard a couple of examples of cases, and I've said we have two roles specifically assigned to us, uh, rendering advisory opinions, deciding these contentious cases. There are two other rules, roles assigned to this court under the UN Charter that are not explicit, but that have to be also part of the vision of setting up a permanent world court as part of the UN structure. The first is that that court has to have the responsibility to develop international law. If you think about it, that's, it's impossible to do otherwise. Um, treaties and international law, like any, in, international, like any legal instrument, don't answer all questions as nicely as we might sometimes like within the four corners of the instrument. They require interpretation, they require application, and when the court interprets those, uh, instruments as it does in every decision, we inevitably develop international law. And the, the, the other way that the uh, court serves an important function is the way that it influences the behavior of states other than the states that are before it in a particular proceeding. I've already said that our decisions do not serve as precedent. Our, our decisions only bind the parties before us. So in that sense, we are not like a common law court. Um, but of course, when lawyers look to figure out the content of international law generally, they give weight to the, what the International Court of Justice has said about international law. Um, so states have to be concerned about the possibility that their conduct could be judged in our court. Um, and sometimes they can view that as a positive. They can say, well, we believe that if we take such and such action, if it did end up in the International Court of Justice, 
our conduct would be supported by the court. So that can be viewed as something that emboldens them or that introduces a note of caution. Even if they make a calculation that they can't think of a way for the court to exercise jurisdiction, they know that the court's jurisprudence, if you will, is percolating in the background of arguments among international lawyers about the content of international law. So these are ways in which the court operates to influence and shape international law outside of the particular cases that are before us. So if you look at the International Court of Justice statute, that's the instrument that set up the court, um, and you ask yourself, well, is this court a civil law court or a common law court? As I've said, our decisions are not precedents for others. They only bind uh, the parties before us. So in that sense, you could look and say, this looks not like, not like a uh, common law court. But at the same time, our statute specifies that the primary sources of law for us are treaties and customary international law, but also that judicial decisions, including our own, can serve as subsidiary sources of law. So there, by making judicial decisions a source of law, um, we are, in fact, operating in a manner that's quite different from the civil law tradition. And if you look at our judgments, you can see that the court has quite a bit of attention to demonstrating what is called a constant jurisprudence, a desire to remain faithful to its own jurisprudence unless there's a compelling reason to depart from it. So there is uh, something of a mix there, but uh, I would say a tendency over time to, to operate uh, and communicate in a manner that's a bit closer to a common law court than to a civil law court. Um, our court, as to procedure and evidence, is left by its statute largely to set up its own rules and ideas. Uh, we do that partly in a set of rules that the court has elaborated and partly, of course, through the practices that develop in our, in our court. Um, I should say, by the way, that among the 15 judges on our court, um, the, the ICJ statute requires that the, uh, that the members of the court reflect the major legal systems of the world and, of course, the common law and civil law distinction is one of the big distinctions out there. And those that's the distinction I'm focusing on today. There are other legal traditions. I don't mean to ignore them entirely. Uh, of the Islamic tradition is often identified, for example. There are customary traditions that continue to have an impact in many states. Um, but most of the judges have been trained in a system that is either substantially common law or civil law, perhaps sometimes with some, some other influences. Um, and if you look at a map that shows the common law and civil law countries, you would see that we common lawyers are greatly outnumbered. And that is reflected in the composition of our court. As of February, there are six out of the 15 of us who come from the common law. When I first joined the court, there were four, then there were five. That's about the range that you would typically expect because of traditions in the way that the court is selected. It, I, it would be very difficult for there to be a configuration in which there were more than uh, six common lawyers. So we are very much in a minority at all time. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about three aspects of our work and compare what we do to what you, what you do uh, here in the, on the common law side. I'm going to talk about how we conduct oral proceedings, how we assess evidence, and how we draft our decisions. So when you think about um, oral proceedings in our, in our courts, of course, they are characterized by a very adversary process. Um, and the civil law system, as I said, is judge-led inquisitorial. Our, our hearings draw from both. The overall structure is party-driven. We have rules, but we look to the parties to guide the, and shape. And so in that sense, it looks like our common law uh, courts. But there are two big differences. And those are that the judges of the International Court of Justice are mostly silent, and there are very, very few witnesses. And so in that sense, the absence of witnesses looks more like the civil law side. Now, why are the judges mostly silent? There are many reasons given for that. But keep in mind that these parties are sovereign states. And um, when uh, a judge asks, asks a question of counsel for that state, the counsel may have an idea what the right answer could be as a legal matter. But the counsel is representing a state. And it is seen as often difficult for that counsel to respond on the spot. When I arrived at the court, the tradition for a number of years had been for the court to remain entirely silent. 
through the entire oral proceeding. And I'm happy to say that since I've been there, a number of us um, have achieved a change in our practice that is now pretty well established, which is um, something of a middle ground. We ask questions of the parties at the close of a session, and we ask that party to respond in the next session when they speak. So they have an opportunity to confer with their capital if necessary before answering. Sometimes if we ask for a particularly difficult question, we, we uh, ask them instead to res respond in writing. But we're trying to do something that's a bit more interactive and that allows us to guide the proceedings more. We've also begun to inform the parties before a hearing of the questions we would like them to focus on in the hearing. And in that way, try to narrow the focus to the things we think will best help us decide the case. Um, and we've got, of course, two kinds of witnesses in theory appearing before our court, fact witnesses and expert witnesses. Fact witnesses are very rare. Um, when they appear, they submit a written statement, and that usually stands as their, as their evidence. There's no direct examination. That is, by the way, common also in international arbitration. But there is cross-examination by opposing counsel, and we judges ask the witnesses question. Many of my colleagues from the civil law side find the idea of cross-examination to be very difficult. They um, are not very comfortable themselves asking questions. And the kinds of questioning that in our system seem acceptable often can cause my colleagues to be deeply offended and um, empathetic with the witness. Uh, and so um, American-style cross-examination can actually um, cause the equities to shift in favor of a witness in a way that one doesn't see uh, in our courts where people are more accustomed to um, a bit of um, pushing on cross-examination. Um, so for expert witnesses, you see a very big difference between a common law system and a civil law system. In the common law system, as you might expect from an adversary proceeding, a party, each party identifies its own expert, comes into court, the expert appears, explains the scientific or technical question of interest to that party. The other side brings in its expert, and the court essentially evaluates that expert testimony, bearing in mind the burden of proof and standard of proof in the case, and decides the answer. In the civil law system, by contrast, the court appoints its own expert, and the expert advises the court behind the scenes about um, the questions that are seen as falling within the expert's competence. So that's very different for us. And um, our statute permits that. Our statute contemplates and lays out procedures for the court to select its own experts. So we can do that. However, we have had expert witnesses recently, and in a hearing in two cases, we have two joint cases that we will hear this week and next week in The Hague. And in that case, we again will have expert, uh, experts on science and technology brought forward to the parties. When we had that uh, happen to us, in a case involving whaling that we decided recently. Now, this was a case that Australia brought against Japan. Uh, those are both parties to the International Convention on the Reg Regulation of Whaling. Sorry, I didn't want my timer to go off. I don't know why it did. Um, so um, uh, that, in, that, in that case, um, Australia said that Japan's whaling off of Antarctica violated the treaty, which, under which there was a moratorium on commercial whaling. And Japan said, no, this convention allows for whaling for purposes of scientific research, and that's what we're doing. So we had scientific experts come on and talk about the kind of activity that Japan was engage, engaged in, and we took account of that in our decision. We found that Japan's activities were not for the purposes of scientific research and, and found for Australia in that case. Um, the way that that case proceeded was that Australia, which is a common law state, came to us with its written submissions that included expert evidence. And, and they said, uh, we plan to put an expert on the stand. Japan, not coming from the common law side, initially had produced no expert evidence in writing, um, but said, well, if, if there was going to be an expert on Australia's side, um, there would be an expert on, the, on Japan's side as well. And we structured a proceeding in which the experts Testi written testimony stood as their direct evidence. They were cross-examined and then questioned quite extensively by judges as well. And that's the procedure that we will follow in the next, uh, in the next uh, cases that we'll hear in the next couple of weeks again. Um, so it's, it's something of a mix um, between uh, a common law and civil law tradition. 
Um, but the door is not closed to the court bringing in its own expert. We can clearly do that under our statute. So it's very difficult if you look at our cases to say, oh, the court has decided to go in the common law direction. Because when we have done so, that has been at the initiative of parties. And as I said, Australia comes from the common law tradition. Um, things could proceed quite differently if we had a case involving scientific and technical evidence in which the initiating party uh, did not ask for a witness or in which the, the parties made clear, for example, that they preferred that we, we the court, would bring, would bring in an expert. Um, so that's a little bit of a flavor of what our oral proceedings look like. Fifteen judges, we're a court of first and last instance, so we have to decide these facts, not like U.S. Supreme Court. Uh, settling, a case, settling a record that is based on mostly a paper record of evidence and pleadings on law and, and, and uh, fact that we hear from the parties first in writing and then in oral proceedings, usually without live witnesses and with not as many questions as we are accustomed to. So then what happens? We go into our deliberation room and we begin to deliberate. And here again, we see some differences. First of all, you hear a lot in your, um, in your legal training about the admissibility of evidence. Well, admissibility, that bar to whether the evidence can even come into court, is important in the US. And of course, our admissibility ideas were built around the notion that the factual determinations would be made by a lay jury. Um, in the civil law system, there is no similar idea of admissibility. There's much, uh, a much more liberal notion of evidence coming in to the proceeding and then being weighed for whatever it's worth. And that's the approach that we follow. Um, and I think it fits better with what we do because we are not a, a jury of lay people. We are judges. And so it's seen that we are capable of not being distracted by potentially prejudicial evidence um, and rather, we can just set it aside. So we, we are liberal about letting evidence into our court. But then what happens when it's in? Well, we have said, um, much as is the case in our court and elsewhere, that a party that wishes to prove a particular fact has the burden of proving that fact. But then what about the standard of proof? What standard of proof applies in a case? Well, you know from your training that we have a standard of proof in a criminal case a standard of beyond a reasonable doubt that is higher than the standard that governs in a, in, a civil, in a civil case, a civil case in the common law system. And in that civil law, on the civil law test, it might be described as a preponderance of the evidence. Sometimes you hear 51%. Um, and uh, my understanding is that in British courts, it's often described as a balance of probabilities. But same idea, basically, uh, of an idea of a standard of proof. So what standard of proof do we, do, we, do we use? Well, on the civil law side, there is no similar concept um, of a standard of proof that applies to particular disputes. And this is a, an issue that is baffling to those of us who are common lawyers. We don't really understand why there shouldn't be one. But um, in the civil law system, the idea is that, that a judge should make an assessment of the evidence based on that judge's intimate conviction intime conviction. Um, the, judge, the judge assesses all the evidence and based on the, the assessment, internal assessment of the, of the judge, makes a decision. Um, so you can see in our jurisprudence that the, the ICJ has not associated itself with a specific standard of proof, nor has it said we are embracing the civil law tradition. But by failing to associate itself with a specific standard of proof, it is in fact implicitly embracing this more open-ended civil law tradition. The closest that we have come is that in cases involving particularly grave allegations, for example, cases in which states are alleged to have committed genocide, we have said that there is a requirement at, of proof at a high level of certainty, suggesting a higher standard of proof than the one that we would normally apply, which we haven't specified. Um, so you can see again here, um, a difference from the way we operate and something of a compromise between the traditions that the judges come from when we uh, evaluate evidence. So we've read the written pleadings. We've been through the oral proceedings that I've described a little bit. Now we've deliberated about the law and about the facts, applying this amorphous standard of proof to the facts. 
Um, then what we do is we um, discuss the case in great detail. We also share our views in writing. And eventually, the, the president of our court um, identifies what seems to be a tentative majority. And from within that majority, we elect two judges to serve as a drafting committee, to draft our, our judgment. We then have a very elaborated process of review as a group of 15 of the entire judgment over several drafts um, and many days of sitting together collaboratively. Um, so what does that lead to in terms of a drafting style? Well, let me, let's talk for a minute about the big differences between the way that judicial decisions look on the civil law side and the common law side. You know what our decisions look like in the United States. Um, if you look at a typical Supreme Court decision, for example, it's quite long. Um, frequently, there is a procedural history, a description of the facts drawn from lower court proceedings. Uh, if there haven't been facts found, then we see the facts as alleged. Um, the author of the opinion is identified, and there are separate and dissenting opinions. By contrast, on the civil law side, the traditional judgment, remember, this is a judgment that is designed solely to settle the dispute between the two parties. The traditional judgment is a single sentence beginning with a series of whereas clauses, considérant que in French. So whereas this, whereas this, whereas that, whereas that. Now, therefore, the court finds that A wins or B wins. Usually, there's very little discussion of the facts. And the reasoning in the way that we understand legal reasoning is not presented. The relevant code provisions, the relevant provisions of law, are described in what civil lawyers see as a precise and logical way. Um, but the application of law to fact, the thing you get graded on in law school, is not part of what you see in those decisions. So it is very, very different from the style um, of drafting that we're accustomed to in the common law. Now, if you think about our common law system, um, our decisions have to lay out the reasons for the decision, because that decision is not only binding on and law for the parties, but it is law for everybody else in the relevant jurisdiction. If it's a Supreme Court decision, it's law for the entire country. So entities out there that, that have interests that might be affected by the particular body law have to study that opinion and decide, uh, is our conduct lawful or unlawful? Do we need to change our behavior? in order to comply with this new law coming out of the Supreme Court. Nothing like that exists on the, on the civil law side. So that's one reason why our, um, our decisions need to be clear in terms of the reasoning that's, that's laid out, and why that, that exercise of distinction is so important in your training and in, our, in, and in the decisions that our courts render. Why is this case different from that case? How does this situation differ from that situation within the context of this particular legal issue? So much of what you do is a manipulation and study of that principle of distinction, uh, and it is critical to the way that we understand the law that emerges from, from our decisions. There's another reason why the reasoning in our Supreme Court decisions and other decisions matter, and that is because um, we don't just assume automatically that whatever a group of judges say is right. Uh, and you can see that every time the Supreme Court renders a controversial decision. Of course, law professors have a lot to say about it, but so do normal people. And uh, the Supreme Court is mindful of that, undoubtedly, when, it's, when it writes its own decisions. It's mindful that not only what it decides, but why it decides it will have an impact on broader national debates. And you can see that, of course, uh, most recently if you look at the, the decision, the recent decision on gay marriage and the debates that are going on about what the court will decide next on that issue. People are very interested in what the court said, why it said it, and what the implications are for the nation on that important issue more generally. So, um, th so now that you have a little bit of a sense of how the common law drafting looks compared to civil law drafting, you get a sense that they're very, very different. So what does that mean for our judgments? Well, um, let's just say that, first of all, our court renders two types of decisions, um, orders and judgments. So orders, when you say hear order, you think, oh, that's probably procedural orders. Um, yes, 
Some of our orders are procedural or you know, somewhat technical. But we issue a, a very important kind of order called a provisional measures order, which is our equivalent of an injunction. So for example, Georgia brought a case against Russia during an armed conflict, and the court issued a provisional measures order um, ordering Russia to take steps that would avoid um, running afoul of the, of the Convention, Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination. Discrimination on the basis of ethnicity is covered under that convention, and that was the basis of the case. Um, so that order was 50 pages long. It was a 50-page sentence because our orders traditionally have followed the French drafting style. So a sequence of, of whereas clauses ending with uh, operative paragraphs at the end that reflect the court's findings. Well, a 50-page sentence is pretty hard to follow, um, even if one is changed in the civil law system. So recently, um, we were able to achieve a change in which we abandoned that form of drafting for our orders, that civil law form of drafting, for our orders other than the technical orders. And we've now moved to a normal, I call it, I try not to say that in front of my civil law colleagues, but a, but a narrative style of drafting, uh, the kind of drafting style that is familiar to us in the United States. Um, so I think that's a, an important development, and one of the reasons we were able to achieve that decision is that in a number of civil law states, as orders in those states have become more complex, there has been a move away from this one-sentence drafting format. So colleagues from some, some civil law countries were more comfortable with it because they saw evolution also within their own national traditions, which was helpful. Um, so when we issue our judgments, our decisions on the merits or our decisions about whether we have jurisdictions, we've not followed that whereas format. We use a narrative style. Um, if any of you has ever tried to re read our judgments, I will tell you right now that I've never known anyone on the common law or civil law side, or anyone, who wants to say that the best example of clear legal reasoning uh, is the International Court of Justice. Um, our judgments are hard to read. Um, they are hard to read partly because the drafters come from these two legal traditions, and the more time I spend there, the more I understand that. They are also hard to read because there are 15 of us, uh, and we draft in a very collaborative manner, and we frequently have differing ideas as we're working through the draft about why we think a certain result is right in a particular paragraph, and we also have different ideas about how much reasoning we should lay out. And again, on the, civil, on the common law side, we feel that it's essential to give reasons for the, the conclusions that are reflected in the decision. And on the civil law side, often there is quite a bit of resistance to doing that. So, so our judgments are hard, hard to read. There's no, there's no doubt about that. Um, but they do largely contain the reasons behind our decision. And although we are not a common law court in a formal sense, if you think about it, the reasons for why we have decided something are very important. First of all, the states that are parties, sometimes one, sometimes both, have to implement our judgment. Our judgments are binding on them, and in general, they do implement them. That usually means that they have to do things, and if they've lost the case, they may be some things that are very unpopular domestically. So we need to equip those leaders in those countries with a set of reasons that can be used by them uh, in dealing with their own domestic political environment to explain why the court reached a particular decision, why a particular result needs, needs to occur. In addition, of course, as I said, our, our, our judgments, while they don't bind others, are looked at by other states in evaluating the, the legality of their future conduct uh, or, of, or that of neighboring states or other states with which they may have disputes. So the more we can lay out the reasons for our decision, the easier it is for a state to discern um, why we acted and therefore what the implications might be, might be elsewhere. And I think also um, it's very clear that this court is um, by no means a court of unquestioned legitimacy. Uh, the court has, in fact, been criticized uh, for many of its decisions, um, especially from within the United States. 
Um, and so the more we can do to lay out our reasons, the better off we are um, being in a position substantively to justify uh, the re results we have taken. We do have dissenting and separate opinions in our court. That is not a tradition found on the civil law side. Um, we, do, we do not reveal the identity of our drafting committee. We, you can tell which judges voted for the majority. Our voting is public, but we keep the members of the drafting committee secret. And that is uh, something that comes from the civil law side, where decisions are the decisions of the court. Um, but it is also something we think is important as a world court because uh, we really do produce these things in a very slow and, and collaborative process. And we worry that if the identity of drafting committee members were known, people would imagine, oh, well, the US and French judge drafted that judgment. Uh, that proves that, uh, that this paragraph was written because that's what the US thinks. Uh, usually that uh, nationality doesn't, in fact, have very much to do with what we're doing, but it is the default instinct that many uh, observers come to when they look at our work. Um, so I think you can see that our drafting, yet again, provides something of a mix between the common law tradition and the civil law tradition. And going back to what I said earlier about the functions of our court, I think that the kind of drafting we, style that we produce, which has much in common with the common law style, really does, re does fit with the functions that were assigned to our court. To settle this particular dispute, to tell the parties why we have settled in a particular way, uh, and thus to help, we hope, facilitate implementation of the dispute, but also to try to shape and influence international law more broadly, as is part of our mandate under the UN Charter. So is it a good or bad thing to have traditions drawing from both worlds? A former president of the International Court of Justice, Professor and Judge Manfred Locks, a distinguished Polish jurist, once said that he thought it was the best of all worlds. Um, I think that could be true, but what I find is that um, because we pick and choose a little bit, sort of like if you um, ordered uh, something from the dessert menu and um, had it served with you with your salad course, you might not really like the combination. I think we have to be careful and realize that these are systems that um, I've given you a very stereotypical uh, description of the, of the civil law system. If you understand it more fully in a richer way, um, you can see actually ways in which the system accommodates some of the concerns on the, on the common law side, but in a very different way. So when we pick and choose from the two, we have to be mindful of the fact that we can create some, coherent, some incoherence. And that's why I think the most important uh, responsibility of any judge in any court, and certainly our court, is to bring an element of self-awareness to our jobs. Um, we are all creatures of our history. I am American trained, and I am a US national. And when I have an immediate instinct to a question of law, to a question of fact, to a question of procedure, I have always to ask myself, why do I have that reaction? Uh, why does my colleague from Uganda or my, uh, or my colleague from Mexico have a different reaction? And sometimes when you scratch the surface, it turns out that one of the reasons is this difference in training on the civil law and common law side. So I hope I've given you a little bit of a flavor of how our court operates, how international courts operate more generally. I hope you will pursue international law as part of your studies, even if you don't intend to become an international lawyer, because I think it can greatly enrich your ability to participate in the community of lawyers more generally. I'm happy to take questions on what I've discussed today or on any other aspect of the work of our court or international law more generally. But let me first say thank you to to Dean Mahoney, and thank you also to Professor Stephen for arranging this. I think you were out of the room when the dean incorrectly described me as having supervised three members of your faculty. Let me just say that the three members of the faculty um, with whom I had the privilege of working at the State Department were very much my teachers while I was there, uh, Professors Stephen, Harrison, and Deeks, and um, they were ter all terrific colleagues, and I'm very pleased to be back with them here today and to be speaking to you as well. Thank you very much.